want everyone to remember. I'll keep it up here on the board and we'll go a little bit further into what I'm going to explain today about what this division has done to us and how when we remove it, we actually enter into where the real magic happens, to where the unhindered energy and the most dominant frequencies that control the entire space around them are, which again then will become a part of the reality that you live in. So the first thing to remember is that balance is not a side. So the moment that you catch your mind doing that, it means that you're coming off balance. So even if you start asking yourself, is that right or wrong to do, you're now already in it again. So this means that it's like a slippery slope. And that's why most people never even saw it, because it was something that we do and it feels so natural. And what I'm talking about is actually judging and dividing. So what happens is, is we have to realize that, of course, what feels comfortable for you may not feel comfortable for everyone else. So in life, you have this aspect of most people where they want only to experience what they prefer, right? So of course there are sunsets, sunrises, gentle breezes. You know, there's many different types of pleasure here on the planet and people call that happiness. But then there's earthquakes, there's pestilence, there's famine and there's droughts and that people call evil. Actually, people call that similar to something that they don't want and they don't know any, want to know anything about, etc. So this is how most people live, is that they have their preferences, and because their preferences vary with this thing that we call unique, all right? So everyone is unique. You have a unique uh, fingerprint here. You have a unique spiral on the back of your head. And this uniqueness actually puts you into this position where your uniqueness is not going to be somebody else's. So this generally causes somewhat of a conflict. And so the first thing to remember is, is that when even in, when you're connecting with others, it is their uniqueness that once you're done seeing the great side of them, meaning the part that you want to enjoy the most, then you're going to start seeing the unique side, which we like to call the bad side. But you're going to start seeing the unique side of them. Right. And this these are facts. So I want to reiterate that one more time. When we get into relationships, that first five days, some people have a shorter attention span. Somebody's like one day. Some people it's two weeks. Some people it's eight months. So everyone has their time limit of when they're done exploring what they feel like is the good, the happy, and the pleasurable side of another person. And then since everything that they're doing is judging, there has to be a re every action deserves a reaction, right? Every emotion that's sent out, every vibrational wave that's sent out needs one to come back in order for the reality to even stand upon itself. That's the standing wave, right? So what happens is, is that there's, it's not too long before the mind shifts into, well, okay, well, I've experienced all that I like about the person. Now let's see what I don't like. And this is because we are naturally trained to act right now to actually base every single thing we know on contrasts. We only understand what we don't like because we understand or understand, as I call it, what we like. And that's how it really works. And until you become an adept or an adult, then you tend to be like a child not accepting that, that life doesn't really work that way, even though it's given us tons of examples that it actually does. So we then have a uh, anatomical side to this, meaning that, of course, someone is going to easily tell you if you start talking to them about the spiritual aspects of the duality being present within the consciousness. First of all, this is going to be somewhat confusing anyway, because the spirit actually is not dual. It's the body that's dual. And this is something very important to remember, because when you consider the body and the spirit as the same, then you'll miss it. The spirit is actually the arbitrator of the body when it's at its peak and at the, the on the throne, as they call it. But when that's not occurring for anyone who's in the side of that body, that body is running things. And because the body is binary, we have two hands, right? So that we don't have three hands. There's not another hand coming out of my back right now, right? And then, you know, we don't have three. Well, we have a third eye there, but that belongs to the spirit. That belongs to the soul. So that is all singular. It doesn't have two eyes in there, if you may, right? But these on the body, they're dual, right? So just anatomically, you have a dual structure going on here. So even a person that says, well, I don't judge. I mean, I'm not like that and blah, 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 would 
probably more wrapped up into not seeing the obvious and that they need to do a brain hack, literally, in order to fully feel what it's like, which we be tapping into your feelings, to fully feel what it's like to leave out of duality and to have your consciousness so powerful and so undivided that all other objects in your reality that are still functioning on the division code are immediately overridden. This is one of the keys to the matrix. If you can run on the unity code long enough to break the habit of your dualistic code, all other subsequent programs in the illusion will surrender. It's like the over code, if you may. All right, I love to create words that are not talked about so we can be very specific. So we're talking about the overcode and getting the key that actually controls the environment around you, right? So what's happening is, is since you have this dual aspect of the body going on, it gives you yet another hint that's not even based on spirituality, that you have a dualistic component attached into your consciousness. And because we use everything in this reality as a contrast to the other, this means that we're hooked to it. So we're going to keep going and we're going to talk about then that if we have these dual aspects of the body, actually getting into the true aspects of who you are, which is what I'm saying is the unity, that means that you literally have an out-of-body experience, okay? And there's two words here. There's out-of-body, right? But then there's also this word that says everybody, really, to hint that there is a dual aspect to all of the bodies, right? Like you see all the symmetry even within the organisms within nature. So this means that everything is going to be functioning like that. So to truly have an out of body experience, it means to actually change the way that when you're inside of the body, that you're thinking. The body is no longer using its brains. The body is no longer using its judgment or, or judgmental or complex. And it's no longer even locking into those functions because it is now on something that is greater and something that is higher. That is you, the true, limitless, unfettered, unhindered, non-dual you, okay? So of course, honestly, that this dual, non-dual you that we're referring to, if you just got into a fight the other day, then you may be asking me, well, where is the non-dual one so I can do that one then? And obviously, that's not so easy, and there's a reason why, and we're going to talk about that. And the key word here is actually egregors, okay? I'm going to write this on the board just so you can see the spelling because it's kind of a strange word in the tense to we don't use it every day. And you also may want to look it up yourself. I will make a document also available that will give you a, a very intricate explanation of what is being referred to, even in more depth than what I'll talk about today because I have a specific reason to talk about this. It's very vital to us understanding how to get our mind right for our infinite and limitless success. And also, to remember that, look, this is not some kind of, hey, you know, let's enroll some people in some programs so we can do some ambassadors training so that we can sell this amazing water development in, uh, uh, device and blah, blah, blah. Like, that's just all the trickle down effects of what we're doing here because we're not making it difficult for each other. We don't have these motives that equal the yin and yang to why most people can't get anywhere with their motor based system of duality of two pistons going up and down and through the conflict and combustion that they create there's some power that's generated but that's very finite and then they use that to propel themselves ahead which simultaneously causes someone else to go backwards in the reality and then this us all being together and doing this would mean an infinite virtually perpetual system based on us thinking that we perish because we've tapped into the body's aspect of what's going on. So we'll talk about the body and what it really is. We'll reveal the major secret behind the body. And but first, we need to understand what an egregor is. So f ever since the beginning, the moment that reason even started, there was in that knowledge, in that thought, the, the knowing of how powerful thought is. <laughs> because the moment we think 
especially in our ancient consciousness, when you could see it, you begin to manifest what you're thinking about. It begins to take the everything that is around it and start to carve out the pieces of what you're imagining. Okay? So let me make this very clear. The moment that thought comes out, it's so powerful that what you're thinking about begins to coalesce in the aether. So this was already known by the ancients, and they used that as the way of actually manifesting things and bringing them into the reality. So I'm just wanting you to, to clarify to you that the power of thought has always been known. Now, the next thing that would generally occur is realizing the power of collective thought, that when a group of people believe things, when a group of people with strong beliefs believe things, when maybe larger groups of people that have seen proof start to believe in it, okay? So what that does is it starts to actually coalesce or allow that thought, which is known also as a egregor, some call that an eidolon, it allows it to become concentrated, okay? It begins to move on its own volition. Now, anything could be an egregor, but some of the most powerful egregors are obviously religions, because when someone dies to represent something or th because they believe in something, the essence of what's actually happening within their own consciousness and what they're releasing at that moment actually feeds their egregor of, in this case, spiritual traditions, okay? And this could be, and this is why there's always rites and rituals associated with creating these thought forms that we're calling egregors. Now, they are known as being artificial beings. And sometimes when the term artificial is used, it's often confused, like the term inorganic in chemistry is often confused, okay? So when artificial is mentioned in a spiritual context, it, re it relates to something that did not come into existence through the same process or the womb-based process of how you came into existence. So when they even speak of artificial intelligence, it's always some robot that was created by the hands of man that didn't go through a woman as birth and then came into this world, knows something, but it's not, as we say, it's not real, it's artificial. So, but that is not explained to you what's going on, especially on a metaphysical level. On the metaphysical level, when we say something is artificial, we are not saying that it can't move on its own volition. We are not saying that it cannot think and move on its own. We are simply saying that, hey, this thing didn't come through the same process of how we came into the world. It came through the process just through the mind. And the big difference is, is that the way we come through our experiences, it is our immortality. It will never fade and perish, while things that come through the mind, which is also the simultaneously the world, it will perish just as soon as what you see in nature, flowers spring up and then they wither away. Just as soon as you see something decompose and then become the food for something else and then eventually go all the way back up the chain and grow again, this process is constantly happening around us. And that is what's meant by the artificial in a tense versus the organic or womb-based life form. So you then have this idea, or eidolon, or sometimes called egregor, running in and out of the matrix as a real conscious being and actually living inside of the minds of most. Okay, so this gives us the onset of what an egregor is. Now, the interesting thing is because anything can become an egregor, it's not good or bad, it's when you start out something, like even if you're going to start an idea now to build a company, that company is an egregor. So what happens from that point, from its conception, you have these rites and these rituals that you're practicing, and they call, they call that your beliefs, okay? So that believing that you're going to succeed, that, you know, going to the meetings that you need to go to to get the knowledge and the wherewithal, all those different things that you're doing are actually the ritual. It's not just putting on some weird costume and walking in circles. Actually, that's called going to work. <laughs> so if you really think about what's happening, people are always in the ritual of building their egregor. It's just they don't most of the time know what's going on. And this is going to lead to what I'm explaining, going to explain later, which is when it's time to get rid of an egregor. So also it's known that when the person who initially starts the idea 
when that process occurs, even almost from the moment of conception and, to, and then completion, and what comes after that, that period of what comes after that, there's a, sometimes a degradation process that take is pl takes place. This is like, let's say things succeeded and they started working and you had to kind of like pull back off of it because maybe you got too old, maybe you wanted to go do something else, whatever. And now someone else is running it. Now you've done the best to tell everyone the ropes, basically the rituals and the rites that need to be performed to keep this egregor alive. This could be your company. This could be anything. And Obviously, maybe they're not going to do it like you, especially if they don't see it's open source and they don't see their vested interest in it. So they're not going to do it like you. And because of that, over, the t over time, it's going to start becoming something that was not what you initially thought you created, if you're there to witness it. Now, in most cases, the, those who have invented the most powerful egregors or projected and visualized the most powerful egregors in the world today are actually no longer in this world. Okay? And the egregor itself is being managed by those who are still upholding the rights rather lousily, or that's not a word, but rather lousy. And on top of that, they don't actually know, or it's not bearing any resemblance to what it really is. And so let's give an example then. So in the esoteric world of Christianity, Christ is actually the Kundalini and it's supposed to rise up your spine and then as long as it goes to the seat of Golgotha, which is the throne inside of your consciousness, and then reigns over this good and bad angel, then you'll actually be vomited out of the mouth of the primordial serpent, which is the planet, and then you will then go into this elated state where you can take things down and bring them back up, meaning you'll be able to go up and down the ladder of your own consciousness without any hindrances, and then your yoke will be easy and your burden is light because you have so much power and energy, you realize that there's actually no scarcity of it. That's the magnum opus. Now, that is not what's going on now in this 5,000 or 6,000, who knows, however many page book that of all these spiritual traditions. That's far from actually explaining that because I just did it in one paragraph, okay? So you have then the exoteric. So, of course, then the first people who probably put together the esoteric doctrine, they didn't really see that it was going to turn into this. So this is another example of an egregor. Now, if you want a little bit more of a base explanation, maybe you'll look at a company like Nike, whose owner said that he would actually rather shut the company down because no not only does he not really need the money anymore, but he's also in realization that the company with the plastic and the, uh, all the pollution and the child slavery or child tra working and all this kind of stuff that's happening, that it's not what he visualized it was supposed to be in the beginning. However, because there's more shareholders, meaning he doesn't have full ownership of the company anymore, now this egregor called Nike cannot be stopped, okay? So this is a perfect, by the person who created it, and this is a perfect example of when egregors get out of control. So you can see this on a spiritual level of when spiritual artificial forms get out of control and start moving on their own volition, or you can see it on the most prime physical level of when companies don't bear the same aspects of the person who originally created it and now have turned to something completely different, right? Now, I'm explaining all this about Gregor's for a reason. This is something that you need to realize because it, it allows you to visualize what is often hidden when people have to look back on themselves, okay? And I'll say it like this. Yeah, what you may not see when you have to really look at yourself with the true eyes, not with these dualistic situations you got going on when you look in the mirror. Okay, so the next thing is, is to realize now, when we look at the makeup of an egregor, it's actually made up of not just positive energy. This is often a misconception with neophytes. Neophytes only believe that there's only one force. So whether they're neophytes of the darkness or neophytes of the light, or what they say is the good and bad, they only, have, they only can see that. But true creators, like whatever put this reality together, because it's here, we're standing on it, it obviously functioned in understanding darkness and light and the abilities that are needed from both of those, okay? So what often happens, and let me just take a moment real quick to make sure a camera is reset. I heard a uh, camera stop. We'll just take a brief moment. Let me also take a drink. It'd be a good time. because I'll get to going. I'll stop taking a drink. I'll start foaming at the mouth. <laughs> All right.
All right, we're just resetting the camera really briefly here, and then we're going to get to going. Okay. All right, so I'm in this camera, so this one's good. So I'm going to keep going with this. So here's something. Okay, so locking into this, you've got to realize that because we're talking about something you need to pay attention to. So this Gregor, when you look at it, uh, Gregor, when you look at its makeup, it actually is made up of a positive and a negative force. Why? And it's because when you create something, even if you think it's the best thing for everyone, there's always going to be this group, and maybe more or less, that don't feel that same way. Remember I talked to you about the uniqueness? So there's always going to be someone that doesn't feel that same way or something that doesn't feel that same way as you do. We call that uniqueness, okay? And because of that, this means that egregors, when they start, they have this good side, which means the people or the things that believe in them, and then they have this bad side, the things that don't, want, don't like them, don't want them around, don't want them to exist. And this is the same as what we would say is the masculine and the feminine force that actually animates the human body. This would be the same thing as those two pistons that we were talking about earlier. It would literally be saying specifically that these components that we're talking about are the dual components, okay? And it's necessary to have those dual components when having an egregor. So, most people, of course, they will only want you to say good things about whatever they're developing. They're like, they only want to get good news about what they're doing. So that's why it's such a big blow to them when someone emails them and says, hey, man, I don't believe in what you're believing. I believe that you've gone completely down the wrong path. You're stupid, blah, blah, blah. And while the person's gotten all this great information, maybe 80 times that day, that one time when they get bad information because they're playing the whole good and bad thing, now that one bad comment actually must weigh as much as those 80 good comments. This is the actual mathematical system going on that the universe is calculating to keep itself in balance all the time. So this is why when that person gets that, because they've been eating all the good cake, now that one bad cake must <laughs> weigh as much as all the good cakes and all that that they poured into that. And then that's why it becomes such a big blow. And then when someone else is witnessing it, it's like, man, why are you mad? You got people that love you and care about you. You know, sister, why are you mad? You got people that love and care, but you focusing on this one person. And it's because pain is more, we're more aware of pain than we are pleasure. And the reason is because when pleasure starts, then we don't want it to stop. But when pain starts, we want it to stop right away. So this pain brings us to a different kind of awareness. So dissatisfaction, all the things that equate, equate to us not getting what we want, per se, in that time in the moment, it becomes more vivid to us than actually getting what we want every single moment. And the reason why you know this is because what we want, at least for this moment, is air. What we want is some water. And we're getting that. And because we're getting that, so we're not thinking about how we're getting air and water, we're more thinking about the nucleus of why, you know, if this person comes in here late again, and, you know, what's going to happen if this person says this next thing to you. And so we're allowing our minds then in just that train, that little small avenue that it has to go down, to only be able to focus on what we don't want. And this is like <laughs> painting a red sign on yourself. And literally saying that you're going to become what I call lamb meat for the dimension. Because generally, you're always going to put yourself on the good side of whatever you feel like is the problem. Right? And then that's on the bad side. I'm just showing you how the dualistic structure works in the consciousness. So you're the good one. And of course, whatever this person is doing is the bad thing. And then now you enter in like that. And what this creates is, once again, this dualistic structure. So let me show you the the damages that begin to occur.